Today we'll talk about <coughs> dependent origination concerning the dependent seizing or the dependent quenching of things. We'd like to call this paticca nirota. Nirota means quenching or ceasing. <clears throat> the aspect of dependent of this story, which is the dependent arising of things, is called paticca samupada. And then the dependent quenching, the quenching down, quenching down of things is called paticca nirota. This quenching simply means not arising. To make something so it doesn't arise, doesn't occur, that's what we call quenching. So quenching is the opposite of arising. For this quenching, it's best to quench this process at the very beginning. But if we're unable to catch it at the very start, then we can quench it at the next instant the next, the next moment. We need to talk about both possibilities for quenching the process of dependent origination. Please recall the last lecture where we pointed out that the beginning of the dependent origination <clears throat> occurs when the inner sense organ, the outer sense object, interact, and then consciousness arises. And the three of these together are called contact. <clears throat> and so we must know how to deal with this from the moment that sense consciousness arises. That's where we have to be able to cope with the situation from the moment that sense, con sense consciousness arises. Or we can say that we must be able to deal with it at the moment or in the moment of patsa or contact. When these three things, the sense organ, sense object, and sense consciousness, function together, we call that contact. And in that moment of contact, we must be ready to cope with the situation. If we don't catch it at the moment of contact, if we slip or are careless, then we still have the opportunity to, to cope with it at the moment of Vedana, at the moment when feeling arises. We can still solve the situation. So if we slip or err at the moment of contact, there's still a chance to deal with this at the moment of feeling. If we don't get it at feeling, there's still a chance to manage things at the moment of desire, of dhanha. And if we, if we miss our opportunity there, then we have to, we have to stop it at the arising of upadana, attachment. But the longer we take, the harder and harder it gets. The best, most convenient and easiest place to, to deal with this arising, this conditioned arising, is at the moment of contact. 
As feeling arises, it becomes more difficult. As desire arises, it becomes very difficult. And then once attachment arises, it's, it's almost impossible. Now the way to cope with the situation at the very beginning is to have sati, mindfulness, right there in the moment of contact. If mindfulness is in time, at the moment of contact, we're completely able to deal with this dependent arising. Now when we say to have mindfulness at the moment of contact, that means that mindfulness will bring correct understanding, panya, or, or wisdom, to the contact as well. And so when the contact is dealt with or is managed with mindfulness and wisdom, then there won't be any problems. When we practice mindfulness with breathing, once our practice becomes successful, mindfulness will be very fast. And it will be fast enough that at the moment it can be there at the moment of contact. And from mindfulness with breathing, wisdom will be sufficient so that we are able to control or regulate the, the contact and to stop the flow of dependent arising right there. It's necessary that there is sufficient wisdom. Then, if when mindfulness is fast enough, that mindfulness can choose, has that wisdom to choose from in order to deal with the, the contact. And so it's necessary to study the various aspects of paticca, samupada, and also the quenching of paticca, samupada, so that there is sufficient, adequate understanding of, of these processes. Then, when mindfulness is quick enough at the moment of contact, it can then retrieve or apply that understanding to the specific moment of contact. This can only be done if we study these matters correctly and if we train with them so that the wisdom is sufficiently complete. So we should study this both ex thoroughly and extensively. So this is just like having a medicine chest full of various cures for diseases and things. We need to have a sufficiently complete medicine chest so that whenever there's a physical ailment, one has a, can choose the proper remedy. Or it's like having a sufficient supply of weapons so that when one is attacked, one can choose the proper weapon for defending oneself. Or when there's work to be done, to have a complete set of tools so that one has the right tool, so that one can pick up the right tool to do the job properly. In the same way, we need to study and train in this in these matters so that wisdom is sufficiently complete and thorough. Then when mindfulness is trained so that it's fast enough, so that it's immediate, instantaneous at the moment of contact, when there's that 
sufficient when there's that very fast mindfulness and the complete, sufficiently complete understanding, then mindfulness will pick up the right understanding to use for this contact right here and now. And so please don't lose interest or be bored by our study of Paticca Samupada. We're going to look into it in sufficient detail for you to develop the understanding that everyone needs. If we explain this or describe it in all its completeness, we must say that we explain it like this. Understanding is, is developed through study and practice so that there's enough wisdom. Then whenever anything happens, or when anything arises at the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, then mindfulness is right there instantly, right in the moment of contact. And then mindfulness goes to wisdom and it retrieves the particular or the wisdom that's appropriate for the particular case. And then it brings this wisdom, this specific wisdom, and uh, applies it in this specific situation. When wisdom is applied specifically like this, we give it a new name. Instead of calling it Panya, we call it Sampajanya, which means wisdom which is thorough and, com and comprehensive. So it's a comprehensive and thorough understanding of the specific occurrence or specific contact. And then so that the there's enough energy the, so that the mind has enough strength to do this. There must be samadhi and, or concentration. All four of these are developed by the practice of anapanasati, which you are, you are studying and practicing here. All four of these necessary tools mindfulness, wisdom, this comprehensive wisdom in action, and samadhi, all of these will be developed sufficiently for you to be able to cope with each of these contacts as they arise. So the stock of wisdom is called panya, panya. And then that specific wisdom, which is used, the understanding in function, the applied understanding of this for the specific case, is called sampajanya. Sampajanya is this comprehensive understanding. Please remember this word, it's a very important one. Sampajanya. Sampajanya. Remember this word and it will help you a great deal. Then there's mindfulness, which is the companion of this Sampajanya. And the two together oversee or deal with the, the experience. And then the power, the strength of Samadhi provides all the energy that's necessary to, to deal with this situation. These four things are something that we need to know about and know and understand how to use. So please give adequate consideration to mindfulness, wisdom, 
ัมปชัญญะแอนสมาธิอันสูงเมื่อมีสติ s ิ e ิ t ิสมาธิมากพอจะเป็นที่ตั้งอยู่ในจุดแรกของการสัมผัสกันแล้วจากความรู้สึกของวิญญาณมันใช้วิธีการสัมผัสที่ตรงนี้เมื่อเหตุการณ์นี้เกิดขึ้นที่จุดแรกของการสัมผัสกันแล้วจากความรู้สึกของวิญญาณมันใช้วิธีการสัมผัสกันแล้วจากความรู้สึกของวิญญาณมันใช้วิธีการสัมผัสกันแล้วจากความรู้สึกของวิญญาณมันใช้วิธีการสัมผัสกันแล้วจากความรู้สึกของวิญญาณ By intelligent, we mean that there is mindfulness and understanding at the moment of contact. If there isn't this wisdom, then it will be an ignorant contact, and it will follow the flow of dependent origination that leads to dukkha, to suffering. But if this there is mindfulness and wisdom at the contact. Then it will be the opposite. It will be a wise contact, and then instead of the the dependent arising of suffering, instead there will be the dependent quenching of dukkha. If the contact is wise, then the vedana that arises. Will be wise. When we talk about wise feeling, what we mean is that the mind has, the mind understands this feeling correctly. The mind sees that feeling is just a natural thing; it occurs naturally, in the way we discussed. And so the mind, whether it's a pleasing or unpleasing. Feeling, the mind isn't doesn't fall into liking or disliking the feeling. The mind isn't tricked by the feeling. This is the meaning of wise feeling. If it's ignorant contact, then there's ignorant feeling, and the pleasant feeling trick the mind into liking it. If it's an Unpleasant feeling. This tricks the mind into disliking it. And sometimes there is not a very clear feeling, and this leads the mind into doubt or confusion. That's what happens when there's ignorant contact. There arises these ignorant feelings, where the mind doesn't understand them and is then pulled into. Liking, disliking, and confusion. So this is the difference between ignorant feeling and wise feeling, which depends on ignorant contact or wise contact. Now, the most important, the most efficient understanding is the knowledge of not self. To realize. Clearly, that these eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind—none of them are self. None of these things are I or mine. And so that when some object makes contact with the senses, and then consciousness arises, the understanding that consciousness is not self—it's neither I nor mine. And to see this, it's just something that arises naturally. I'll finish this one, and then we'll get out of the rain. <laughs> If and then when patsa contact occurs, this needs to be seen as not self. It's just something that naturally happens when there's this interact when interaction between the senses, sense object, and then consciousness arises. We have contact. And then the natural result of contact is feeling. It has nothing to do with the self, a soul. It's neither I nor mine. The essence of the matter is to have this understanding: that the sense organs, the sense objects, the sense contact, the sense consciousness, and feeling 
None of this is a self. It's neither I nor mine. This understanding, this wisdom, will solve the, the problems. And so when there is mindfulness and it retrieves wisdom so that there is sampachanya, a ready and specific constant comprehension, then that contact is wise. It's not a foolish contact. When the contact is wise, the feelings that arise are wise. They're understood as they actually are according to nature. And this means that they don't deceive the mind into falling in love or falling into aversion, anger, or falling into confusion. The pleasant feelings will, if they're ignorant, will deceive the mind into falling in love. If it's unpleasant, the mind is pulled into aversion or hatred. And if it's an uncertain ignorant feeling, then the mind will fall into confusion. And this, this is the arising of tanha, ignorant want or desire. But if there is wise feeling, then these, this ignorant desire doesn't occur. Instead, there's just a wise wanting, which takes the form of what we call aspiration. It's a wise want that is completely cognizant of, of natural law. When there's wise want instead of ignorant want or desire, then upadana, attachment, doesn't arise. When there's none of this, this blind want, then there's no arising of the sense of I, of mine, that we call attachment. Instead, when there's this wise want or aspiration, there arises <clears throat> the knowledge or understanding of what needs to be done to deal with this, this situation. So, the ignorant feeling, ignorant want leads to attachment to the I and my feeling. But if there's wise feeling, wise want, then we know what we need to do in response to this situation and there's no no attachment so when there's this when upadana doesn't arise when this this ignorant concept this foolishness of I and mine doesn't arise. Then instead there's just wisdom, panya, panya, understanding what to do right here and now in this situation. And then when upadana, attachment doesn't arise, then when the attachment to self doesn't arise, then there isn't existence. There isn't the existence of self. And when this existence of self doesn't arise, then the birth of self doesn't occur. And so this is how this, this process can go in the way that doesn't lead to suffering, the way that is not suffering where there's wise feeling, wise want, wisdom, and the existence and birth of self don't occur. So when anything happens to the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, when some sense object 
comes in. If there is true understanding of Vaticha Samupada, then we're able to take advantage of whatever it is. One can receive benefits, can benefit from whatever has come into the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. But if there isn't this understanding of dependent origination, then whatever it is will just give us pain and suffering. This is the importance of understanding dependent origination. It deter if we under whether or not we understand this determines whether the objects that stimulate our senses will give us benefits or suffering. So when contact is ignorant, it leads to dhanha, desire. This dhanha can never be wise. Dhanha is always ignorant and blind. So when we say desire, it, we, the way we mean it, it can never be right. It will always be wrong. And by wrong, we mean it's a mistake that leads inevitably to attachment and suffering. But when there's mindfulness at the moment of contact, wisdom comes in, sampajanya functions. Then there's wise contact, and this leads to aspiration, which aspiration can be both right or wrong. But when there's this mindfulness and wisdom, the aspiration will be correct. And correct means that it won't make the mistake of letting suffering occur. This, this is the difference between these, the two ways, the way of dependent arising and the way of dependent quenching. And please don't forget our warning that this must be studied as a science, not as a philosophy. To merely speculate about these things, to argue about them logically or based on our opinions will be of little value and may cause a lot of trouble. Instead, just deal with the reality. Look carefully at the reality of this, these dependent arisings. It's happening right here and now. And so we can study it scientifically in our own experience. It won't, it's not enough just to guess at this, to hypothesize, and so on. Please study this directly in experience, and then you will have a true understanding of this Paticca Samupada. Even if you study this as from a psychological point of view, <clears throat> please make sure that that is a truly scientific psychology and not just the pseudoscience of mere psychological theories and opinions. So we've discussed how to deal with the situation at the very beginning, at the moment of contact. Now what should we do if we slip at the moment of contact and allow ignorant feeling to arise? What is needed then is a lot of understanding, a lot of panya. If ignorant feeling arises, it will take a lot of wisdom to examine that feeling and transform it into wise feeling. Wisdom needs to look at that feeling and see that this feeling, whether pleasant, unpleasant, or whatever, is merely a natural phenomenon. When the sense 
when the nervous system is stimulated, it's a natural reaction that there will be these feelings. There's nothing more to it than that. So it's, it's just this natural reaction. There's no special meaning or significance to it. And it's surely not I or mine. It's just that. It's, it's only this. It's what we can call da ta da. It's just what it is. If there's enough understanding of this feeling, then that ignorant feeling, the ignorance can disappear and it becomes wise feeling. And so whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or uncertain, that feeling will lose its ability to deceive the mind. This takes a lot of wisdom. Now what happens if feeling is completely ignorant and tanha arises, this, this stupid wanting, this desire arises? there's still a chance to do something about it, but it's going to be very, very difficult. To deal with tanha, mindfulness must, must be incredibly fast. Wisdom must be thorough and complete. Sampachanya must be very specific, ready and together, right there. And there has to be a lot of samadhi, takes a lot of energy to do this. To, to solve the situation at feeling is already difficult, but to do it here at, in the moment of, of desire is, is very difficult. It's, it's almost too much for us, but if there's an incredible amount of mindfulness, wisdom, sampajanya, wisdom in action, <coughs> and samadhi, it's, it can be done. What we need to do is that if there's enough, if sati is there and it's very quick, very clear, if wisdom can see the ugliness of this desire, to see what a foul and, and harmful thing desire is, if wisdom can see desire correctly, then there will arise an aversion to it, a fear of this, of this desire and the pain that it will cause. If wisdom is strong enough, deep enough to do this, then this, the flow of the Paticca Samupada can be cut even here at Danha, but it's very, very difficult, nearly impossible. But it's still, we have to try if it's gotten this far. And so, if there's desire is ended or stopped, then there's no attachment coming up. When there's no attachment to self, the existence of self doesn't arise, and then the self, the birth of self, doesn't occur. And then there is, there is nothing to suffer, there will be no dukkha. So this is Paticca Samupada in the aspect of quenching. This is the end. This is the end of dukkha or the quenching down of suffering. We can call it the quenching or extinguishing aspect of dependent origination, or we can just call it paticca nirota, dependent quenching. Now we need to look at the situation where upadana or attachment arises. We need to be able to deal with this somehow because attachment to self inevitably will cause suffering. So if we can't stop it here, it's going to lead to dukkha. So we have to find something 
to be able to do in this situation. What we can do is we need to understand what is meant, what the self is, or what this idea of self can mean. When we talk about self, we can do it in three ways. And to deal with attachment, we need to understand all three of these ways of understanding self. The first way is called atta, atta, which is one extreme of the complete, full-blown self. And then the other extreme is nirata, nirata, which is nothingness that there's nothing at all. It's a complete denial of the self and anything. And then the third is anatta, anatta, which is the self, which is not self. On the one extreme is the self that is grasped at and believed to be a real self. On the other extreme is the self that is denied, the, that is annihilated. But in the middle is anatta, the self which is understood to be a, not a self, the self which is not self. If we understand these three ways of, under, of seeing self or Resp- relating to self, then we'll, it'll be much easier to cope with the arising of attachment and we may be able to do something about it. If the attachment is positive, it leads to this atta, the full self, this complete belief in a self that is really a self. If the attachment is negative, then it leads to this denial, this no self, there's no self, there's nothing. But if there's neither positive nor negative, if there's no attachment to positive or negative, then there is merely the self which is not self. See these three clearly. On one extreme is the full self. On the other extreme is no self, the extreme of there's no self at all, nothing. And in the middle, there's the self that is not self. To understand this will allow us to have, be able to do a little bit or do something about the arising of attachment. So although this feeling or sense of self is something instinctual, something that's going to happen for all living things, especially for human beings, although this is going to happen naturally, we need to study this and see it as being not self, that this instinctual self is not really, really a self. This will happen. There's no way of avoiding this instinctual self in life. But if it's studied, then we see, hey, this instinctual self isn't really a self. It's the self that is not self. If we can understand it in this way, avoiding the extremes of a full self, a complete self, an eternal self or whatever, or the other extreme of no self at all. If we see it correctly, then we can we can deal with attachment. And what's funny about all this is that this this I or we, this I that we feel all the time. Everywhere we go, we're aware of ourselves, 
of me, of I. What's funny is that this I that we are always aware of isn't really I. It's the I that is not really I. If we look into this and see it clearly, we'll have the tool to to respond to, to live with, to deal with this naturally occurring sense of self, of I. If I were to tell you that you are the you that is not really you, you would laugh, you would, and you would, you would accuse me of lying. But this is the absolute truth. You are the you that is not really you. This absolute truth of not self, of the self which is not self, is the essence of Buddhism. The whole intention, the single purpose of Buddhism is to help human beings to understand the self that is not self. The belief or doctrine of an eternal self or soul that goes on forever and ever, that gets reborn in future lives. This is Hindu. This is a Hindu belief. It's not Buddhist. The belief that there's no self at all, that there's nothing, is just a nihilistic wrong understanding, which is not Buddhism at all either. But the self that is not self, this is the, the correct, this is the teaching of Buddhism. Hinduism seeks the eternal self. The goal of Hinduism is the eternal self. Buddhism, however, has as its goal eternal, the eternal void, the eternal or permanent, perpetual voidness of self. Voidness means completely free and empty of I and mine, free and empty of self. This voidness is the, the goal of Buddhism. If you are interested in understanding Buddhism, you would do, it's absolutely necessary for you to study and understand this voidness. If you can understand it, then it will help you to solve all the problems of life. But you must have a correct understanding of voidness. Some people think that voidness is negative, but this is incorrect. Voidness, the correct understanding of voidness is neither positive nor negative. Voidness is beyond both the positive and negative. It's void, it's empty of both positive and negative. If we understand Buddhism correctly, then we'll be beyond the influence of positive and negative, absolutely. So if we understand this, this essence of Buddhism, the reality of voidness, then we'll, it will allow us to solve the situation of when attachment arises. If we understand that everything is absolutely void of self, void of I and mine, then we can cope with this situation so that suffering does not arise. So please give special attention to this matter. Study it so that it can benefit benefit you supremely. So the understanding of voidness, 
of the void is what you need so that dependent origination will not cause you any problems. If you practice mindfulness with breathing completely, then you will develop this necessary understanding. In mindfulness with breathing, there are four main areas of, su of study. The body, the feelings, vetana, the mind, and then dhamma, or natural truth. In the area that studies natural truth, there will arise a comprehensive and deep understanding of not-self, of voidness. And so through a complete and successful practice of anapanasati, one will have the necessary understanding of the void, of voidness. The, the ability, skill, and understanding that arises from the practice of anapanasati <coughs> will allow you to, to deal with dependent arising completely. You'll have everything you need so that this dependent origination of suffering will no longer trouble you. So please give this practice of mindfulness with breathing meditation proper effort, attention, and dedication. And we hope that all of you will meet with success in, in your practice so that you can solve the, the problem of life, the, the dilemma of suffering. In doing so, then, you will have fulfilled your purpose of coming here as a pilgrim and your time and effort here will have been will be of tremendous value so we express our happiness once again that you have come for this purpose in this way and we will finish today's talk also thank you for being good listeners in spite of the vagaries of the weather